As I look at my five-year-old son, my heart fills with joy. He's just like any other kid his age. I remember how fragile he was when he was born and how he faced developmental delays later on. But little did I know, this challenge would unexpectedly unlock the true essence of my wife. Eight years ago, I married Karen. She was a smart and beautiful woman. I was in love and certain that she was the one I needed in my life. Soon enough, Karen became pregnant, a surprise since we hadn't planned for kids at the time, but we were open to the idea. Time passed, and our son came into the world. Despite the initial happiness, his birth was followed by challenges. He was weak, and we spent a lot of time in hospitals. We were fully immersed in the treatment process. Doctors warned us that the odds of his normal development were slim. As he fell behind in his milestones, the joy seemed distant. It was hard to stay hopeful. We invested considerable time in countless doctor visits and specialists, with my parents providing significant support. Our child didn't attend daycare instead, his grandparents were always with him. At some point, my wife began going to church and would be gone for entire days. She became deeply involved in religious matters and believed that she had the knowledge to help our son heal through prayers to God. Although I wasn't particularly religious myself, I believed in the power of faith, so I supported her. It genuinely provided her with comfort and hope. She attended church services regularly and prayed for our son's recovery. I didn't delve into the specifics much, but I saw how she would come home from these visits, calm and content. One day, she told me she wanted to visit a monastery in a different city, where there was a holy place and a special icon she wanted to see. I wasn't overly thrilled about the idea, but I didn't oppose it either seeing the excitement in her eyes and hearing her describe her expectations. And so, she began traveling to various sacred sites, praying for our son's health. I understood that this was her psychological way of coping, and I didn't want to hinder the path that brought her some relief. We were all searching for ways to help our child, and if her faith provided her strength and hope, that mattered to me. I knew these were her psychological means of dealing with the situation, and I didn't want to put barriers in her way if it provided her some form of relief. When Karen was away on her trips to monasteries and churches, either I or my parents would take care of our son. However, despite all her trips and prayers, no miracle occurred. My parents and I continued to monitor our child's condition and consult different specialists. Yet, Karen seemed to be growing distant. She saw salvation solely in church, and her participation in our child's care practically dwindled. Around a year after her nationwide pilgrimage to holy sites, I decided to work from home one day. Opening up the computer, I noticed an unclosed social media page belonging to my wife. With each new message that popped up on the screen, a sense of dread washed over me. The messages were invitations to meet and spend time together. I opened the conversation and saw content that shook me to the core, sending a wave of shock through me. The page was filled with messages from men inviting Karen to intimate encounters. I felt like my trust had been shattered and an internal chill of fear took over. Mixed emotions swirled within me, anger, hurt, and concern. Questions arose about what had been happening in her absence and what stories my wife had been concealing. This revelation opened my eyes to the reality of what had been happening behind my back, and I realized that a serious conversation was in order. In the past few months, my modest and excessively religious wife had been exchanging messages with multiple men. Through these messages, it became clear that they were her lovers. Her correspondence was explicit, and she even sent them photos of herself. It turned out that she had several lovers, and instead of visiting sacred sites, she spent time with her lovers. 
it was all so repulsive and revolting to me. Meanwhile, while she was away, I took over the care of our son, collaborating with my parents. She would come home after what she called prayer sessions and tell us how she prayed for our son's health. She was stunningly deceptive, it was hard not to believe her. While she was having fun with her lover's eye, along with my parents, was trying to cope with the situation by combining work, childcare, and doctor visits. When my wife returned, I told her that I knew all about her second life. To my questions, she simply lowered her head in silence and said that I didn't understand anything. She even audaciously looked into my eyes and asked if she should pack her things. Our child seemed unimportant to her. I replied affirmatively that yes, she should leave. Such repugnance cannot be forgiven. And so, we started living without her. Our efforts were eventually rewarded our son became more active and even started speaking. It was one of the happiest days of my life when I could forget about my wife's betrayal and deceit and focus on why I was living, for the recovery of my child. Karen never once came to see our son or called him during all those years. In her eyes, he simply didn't exist. Some of my acquaintances, upon learning the truth about Karen, advised me to conduct a DNA test. They said that there was a strong likelihood that he wasn't mine. However, I declined. I thought that even if I found out he wasn't mine, it wouldn't change my commitment. So, I chose not to pursue the DNA test. He's mine, and that's that.